My name is Danny Forster, and this is Build It Bigger. I've spent years traveling the globe, investigating some of the world's most important construction sites. But right now, I'm going to take you 6,000 feet under the Swiss Alps into the world's longest tunnel. The Goddard Base Tunnel, the most ambitious tunneling project ever attempted, cutting 36 miles through one of the world's largest mountain ranges. Two teams are working through one of the most dangerous geological zones on the planet. If you encounter some bad geology halfway through, it's not like you can go around it. No, you have to go right through it. On the one hand, tunneling with one of the biggest machines ever built. A 30-foot tall drill bit that is mining right through the earth. And on the other, blasting through 7,000 tons of rock each day. All right, so the charge is in. We're going to blow the crap out of this wall. After 12 years and 34 miles of digging, they're just four months away from the final breakthrough, revolutionizing transit through the Alps forever. I'm in Switzerland, famous for its handcrafted timepieces, milk chocolate, and political neutrality. But more importantly, Switzerland is the geographic epicenter of Western Europe. Two-thirds of all freight sent between Northern Europe and Italy is transported through this tiny country, just half the size of the state of Maine. But despite its convenient location, Switzerland is a geological anomaly. Over 65% of the entire country is covered by the second largest mountain range in the world, the Alps. With soaring peaks over 15,000 feet high, the Alps form a 700-mile-long barrier between northern and southern Europe. And at present, the only way to get from one side of the country to the other is up and over the mountains. To scale the Alps today, trains climb over 5,000 vertical feet, slowly weaving through sharp curves at just 40 miles an hour, a quarter of their top speed. This steep route also forces trains to operate at half their capacity, despite freight demands growing by 75% each year. With Switzerland becoming the economic conduit between northern and southern Europe, there is an absolute need to find a way to not go over the mountains but right through them. Switzerland has launched the most ambitious tunneling project ever attempted, 6,000 feet under the Alps. The Goddard Base Tunnel will be the longest in the world, stretching 36 miles from one side of the Alps to the other, more than four miles longer than the channel connecting England to France. When complete, the tunnel will consist of two parallel tubes, each 30 feet in diameter. Soon, high-speed trains will cut straight under the base of the Alps for the first time ever, doubling the current freight capacity and dramatically changing transportation through Europe. I mean, it's more than just making freight move more quickly. Exactly. Alps and mountains are part of the Swiss identity, but it's something that blocks us from the south. And for centuries, people have looked to have a, a fast way through the Alps. And it's not only about transportation, it's also a, a cultural exchange. It brings regions uh, together. To build this revolutionary route, 2,000 workers have excavated 24 million tons of material, enough to build the Great Pyramid in Egypt five times over. After 12 years and 34 miles of digging, the tunneling teams have just two miles left to go. They'll meet up under the deepest part of the Alps, 6,000 feet below the surface. And today, we're headed 17 miles from the southern entrance, where one team has encountered some of the hardest rock on Earth. Now we're about to begin a 45-minute journey in that train, deep into the tunnel, to the very active edge of where the tunnel's happening. It's kind of pretty, really. OK. relative to where we are in the mountains. 
We're now basically under the main ridge of the Alps. Of the, Alps. the pressure from the mountain overhead creates one of the toughest rocks in the world, granite. Six times harder than concrete, it's what's slowing down the tunneling team. So the length of the tunnel, the height of the Alpine mountains, uh, the rate at which you have to build that, all of that has come together to sort of create a situation that's unprecedented for tunneling. Yes, the challenges that we had here on this project will actually probably never happen again. No one's been at these depths in the Alps before. No, I mean, we never know where we're going. I mean, we're, like, we're like astronauts. We're putting our foot every day on a rock where never, no one has ever been before. Well, after about a 45-minute train ride, it's time to go to work. All right, we're here. So although it's a little bit hard to tell, although it looks like I'm on some big metal rig, this is the TBM. This is the tunnel boring machine. This thing is 1,200 feet long from the back to the front. And essentially, this is what it's all about. A 30-foot tall drill bit that is mining right through the earth. One of the biggest machines on the planet, the TBM is a 3,000-ton drill as long as four football fields. It bores through the mountain with a 30-foot tall rotating cutter head that pushes against the tunnel face, crushing the rock, advancing the tunnel an average of 90 feet a day. All right, so now I'm actually inside the chamber, directly behind the cutter head. And if you look around over here, those are the cutters. Those are the actual rotating devices that are making contact, physical contact, with the front of the tunnel. The 66 disc cutters located at the front of this TBM shear off more than 7,000 tons of rock each day. They've been boring through the granite for 18 hours straight and they've become worn down. Now, if the sharp edges are worn more than an inch without being changed, it can slow the TBM from a maximum of 120 feet a day to just nine. The crew has to repair this battered cutter head before they can continue drilling. The question is, have they been worn out? Do they need to be replaced? And the man who can figure that out is Martin. Martin, give me some screen. Martin is from Germany, does not speak a lot of English, but we're going to make this happen because we're both now 6,000 feet under the Alps. There's not really a lot of time to try and have a cultural exchange. So this is our machine here. Martin uses a specially designed caliper to measure how much of the cutter has been eaten away. If the reading is more than 25 millimeters, then the cutter has been worn down too much and has to be replaced. Myself? and Martin are gonna climb into the cutter head, right, 30 feet tall, measure all 66 cutters, and find out what has to go, what can stay to get this machine back to mining. Not, not much below me. Good. All right. The cutter head is as tall as a three-story building, pushing through the granite with 26 tons of force. Look at him down there. The cutters wear down after less than 12 hours of drilling, 10 times faster than in softer rock. I'm going in your home, Martin. Stay there, Martin, don't you worry. 16,3. Ah, baby. Martin, how are you? <laughs> fine, fine. You're good? <laughs> We're now in the bottom of the cutter head. I'm actually at the very underside of this 30-foot disc. And what we're here to check out is right there. There's the cutter right there, Mark. So let's measure this cutter head. All right, so now look, as the caliper extends, this is the whole point here. We look at that number, it's 18.3 millimeters, which means this cutter head of the 66 can remain onto the next cutter. How much? 4.8. 4.81, so we like that. That one's good. Next. 7.1. 7.1. Also a, an opportunity for joy. Ah, it's OK. It's pretty good, though. Seven. It's good. Happy. This 20 good. Very good. I guess, really, when you're dealing with 66 different cutter heads, it's hard to get excited after each and every one. After measuring, we found that three of the cutters need to be replaced before the TBM can get back to work. So essentially, what Martin's doing right now is uh, taking out the old cutter head. Oh, here it is. There it is. 
He's got it. There goes the old cutter. Over the course of the project, Martin has replaced more than 10,000 cutters. Each one is made of 300 pounds of solid steel, so the crew uses a hydraulic crane to maneuver them into position. All right, and so this right here is the cutter. You'll notice the steel is at its full length, so this is the new stuff. Got to get the old stuff. It's basically like changing a tire, a very heavy tire. You know what I mean? So we've swapped the old one out. Next step is bringing the new one. And now it's about getting it to fit in the hole, which seems to involve Martin's feet. There it is. Nice. So he's generally gotten into place. He's now using a pry bar and a wedge it over. The cutter is specifically designed with just two bolts. Oh. For fast installation, even in awkward locations. Now Martin's shooting. Martin is now fully actually making the show by himself. Hi, uh, guys. Martin's now photographing his own work. Pretty good stuff. Martin, as far as I'm concerned, you shoot it, and then I'll do all the work. <laughs> it's incredible that there's 66 of these things, and you can imagine they're getting worn down constantly. And this is what it takes to just change out one cutter in one unfortunately inconvenient location. All right, so the old one was taken out. Yeah. The new one is in. Finished? Press finish. You did good. Yeah. You did good. You're a fast Come man. On. And now, thanks to his nimble hands and sort of perspicacity, this cutter head is ready to get back to work and start building this tunnel again. Coming up, using a 1,000 pounds of explosives. This is like full on, should I cut the red wire or the white wire situation? To blast through one of the toughest mountains on Earth. The Swiss are known for being incredibly precise. Whether it's their handcrafted timepieces or their famous train system, which, by the way, I can personally tell you, departs and arrives exactly when they say it will. And they're going to need that level of accuracy, because the tunnel they're building is not just the longest in the world, but it also has to accommodate some of the fastest trains ever built. Trains will pass through the Goddard Tunnel at over 150 miles an hour. And at these speeds, even slight curves could cause a derailment. For tunneling teams on either side, this means digging a direct route through 36 miles of rock and meeting at an exact point 6,000 feet under the Alps. I mean, how accurately do you need to be? We need to be, we have a tolerance of 12 centimeters, which is this much that we can use to me. It's like a bow and an arrow and you don't see the you don't see the target, but you still have to be right in the in the target, right in the middle point. It's incredibly close and you're shooting an yeah. arrow essentially yeah. blindly yes. over a trajectory of miles. That's about one and a half miles still left, yes. And what I find to be so amazing is that you have a set beginning point, you have a set end point. If you encounter some bad geology halfway through, it's not like you can go around it. No, you have to go right through, and that's that's the main goal of this of this tunnel. Yeah? You, you cannot change the geology, geology. Ideally, two tunnel boring machines would work towards each other, meeting in the middle. But on the north end of the tunnel, the drilling team has hit a patch of soft rock with fault lines. If they bore straight through, it could crush the TBM. So they had to resort to an older method of tunneling. So of the 36-mile-long tunnel, 90% of it is drilled by using a TBM, a tunnel boring machine, that can bore through as much as 75 feet each and every day. But for the area where I'm standing in right now, this one 10% section, there are so many fault lines, it's too dangerous to use a TBM. So instead, they're kicking it old school and drilling and blasting. Blasting away the rock is 10 times slower than using the TBM but it's the only solution that'll work in this volatile area. The mountain's enormous pressure creates a squeezing effect, shrinking the tunnel's diameter by almost three feet. 
making it too small for future trains. Now to prevent this, they're blasting a three foot wider diameter tunnel, allowing the rock to naturally squeeze down to the right size, matching the other side. So this thing is called a three boom camera. Essentially three different drill bits that can put as many as 120 holes into that wall. These holes are filled with ammonium nitrate, a liquid explosive that blasts away the rock, advancing the tunnel nine feet at a time. Coming up. Okay. So now I'm inside the cab of the three boom tan rock, and it's this thing and this man right here that are actually driving this thing and supporting this rock bit. How are you doing? You're smoking. That's good. Because we're in a confined space in a tunnel with very little air, so you do? You're okay. Yeah, you're both smoking. Good. Fun. What this man is doing when he's not smoking is actually drilling into the side of the tunnel. Hang on one second before you just want to take a quick smoking break. Get that, get that out. Lights lit up and spread away. Once we have that done, we can focus back on the drilling to make sure that it doesn't blast. Assuming everyone has a cigarette. So actually, if you look here at the computer screen, it sort of sums up what we're up to. This is a cross-section of the tunnel right in front of us, and the goal is to locate 120 holes on this face and drill those holes, filling each of one with explosives so we can push that wall out and grow the tunnel. Are you smoking back there? This guy loves to smoke. To precisely control the diameter of the tunnel, a surveyor pinpoints the location of each hole within an inch, evenly distributing them across the rock face. All right, so at this point, we're almost done. Almost all of the 120 holes have been drilled, and the next step is to load them, or in other words, fill them with liquid explosives. So you can see the charge right here, right? It's essentially a small little, little bomb in my hand, and I'm gonna stick this in the very tip of my hose, right? We're actually gonna shoot this hose with the liquid explosives and push this charge into the very back. Therefore, when the blast goes off, this charge will actually accelerate the blast, loosen more rock, and get us those nine feet we need. Okay, ready? The charge, the tip of my spear. Push it in, push it in. Push it in. Push it in. I'm in, I'm in, nine feet, I'm in. Yes, one, yes. Bring in the juice, and now, right now, he flips the switch, the switch is flipped. Now, in this hole, look at that wig. There she is. All right, so the charge is in. We're going to blow the crap out of this wall. Keep, keep up. Keep going. All right, all right, okay, here we go. The charges are tied together and timed within milliseconds for maximum control, starting at the center and radiating out. The last charges to explode are at the bottom of the face, loosening up the pile of debris, making it easier to remove. The last thing to do is to take, if you look right here, the fuse that's connected to every single one of the holes, connect that to this right here, all the explosives getting tied together with this last piece of, well, yellow electrical tape. You would have thought it a little bit more uh, sophisticated at this point, but that's it. With the fuse connected, the explosives are live. The team retreats 900 feet up the tunnel to clear the blast radius. When the multi-million dollar equipment starts to get backed out of the way, you know it's time to go, so we're there. All the holes are filled, charges are connected, we are done, everyone's evacuating. We're ready to blow this thing up. All right, so we're gonna hide behind this steel container right here. Now, there should be enough protection, but I wanna make this clear. The blast is happening right over there in a straight line. Okay, that's it down there, that's the end of the wall. So we're not down a corner, we're not hiding far away. There are just over 100 blasts to go before the tunnel is done. And the honor of setting them off goes to the construction company's largest shareholders. And as we speak, in his hand are the two wires that came all the way from that wall, physically dragged all the way there, right? He's got the wires there, he's tying them into the detonator, one to the next, this is like full on, should I cut the red wire or the white wire situation? There's about 14 different people from the company to my left here. Grande. Well, there they go. 
Apparently what's required to set up the battle here is that you have to have a substantial amount of uh, stock in the company. I have none, so I didn't get to blow it up. He did. Did a fantastic job. The blast went off. All is well. Potentially the rock wall has been pushed back nine feet, and I'm going to start buying stock in this company. So in a couple of years, if I stay focused, I too can blow something up. The blast puts off superheated ammonia gas. So we have to wait 30 minutes for it to clear before we can check the damage. There's still a lot of residue in the air, so your eyes do burn. Even with the gas mask, it's really hard to breathe. You can feel the ammonia in the air. Well, what do you think? Tip top, tip top. Tip top, good? Uh, the man is happy. It'll take the remainder of the day to shuttle all 6,000 tons of debris five miles out of the tunnel. Oh, well, look at this. Where I'm standing right here, 15 minutes ago, was a solid wall of tunnel. And now, I'm standing on the residue. The tunnel has been grown, pushed back by nine additional feet. And they're gonna spend the rest of the day pulling out the muck and getting ready for the next blast. Coming up, preventing a catastrophic cave-in with a one-of-a-kind technology. Yeah, it can collapse and fall down. And that's a great problem. Uh, that's a big problem. Yeah. So I'm now driving through the Swiss Alps, one of the largest mountain ranges in the world. And it's complicated. I'm climbing over 5,000 vertical feet. And to do that, you have to negotiate these incredible curves, one hairpin turn after the next. For more than 800 years, people have been searching for a faster route through the Alps. But it just wasn't possible until now. Because to build a tunnel straight through these mountains, engineers had to overcome some of the most complex geological conditions in the world. Generally speaking, land masses are formed by a series of earthen deposits, one on top of the next for millions of years. This creates a horizontal stratification of layers. Now, as you can imagine, this is great for tunneling. The TBM goes in on one side and has the same consistent rock type all the way through the tunnel. However, here in Switzerland, things happened a bit differently. When the tectonic plates made contact, they actually folded upwards, creating a series of vertical stratifications, which make an amazing mountain range, but also make a lot of different geological types. So when the TBM goes into the mountain, it hits one type and then a second type, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. Multiple different problems requiring multiple different solutions. While the blasting team works through dangerous rock on the north side of the tunnel, on the south side, the TBM has been drilling through solid granite for more than a week. But they've just hit a new layer of soft rock only two miles from the finish line. So the TBM has encountered some really sketchy geological conditions. Frankly, it's so dangerous, they're not able to just bore forward. So instead, they're doing a probe. And the way they're doing that is with something called the exploratory drill. The drill literally feels its way through the rock 360 feet in front of the TBM to find out if it's hard or soft. If the rock is too soft, there's a high chance it can cave in while drilling, burying the $30 million TBM and the men working on it thousands of feet below the Alps. So for example, if the drill steel goes right into the rock very quickly, you know it's soft. Exactly. But if the drill steel has to fight its way through, yes. you know it's very hard. Yes, we stay also here with our eyes of geologists, not only with digital data, to look at the rocks, how they behave. You have to actually see, feel, understand the rock. Yes. Because in reality, you're still working blind. I mean, you never actually see the rock, but only you see the way in which things interact with the rock. Exactly. It's uh, easier today to see, to look at the surface of the moon than to know exactly what we have 10 meters inside this, uh, this rock mass. <laughs> To probe 360 feet into solid rock, the drill is made up of 36 10-foot-long sections joined end-to-end. -end. So as you can see, what we're going to do is blast that on, tighten it up, lock it in. So in doing so, we've added a new piece of steel, creating one long 360-foot probing stick that tells us what's happening out in front of the TBM. 
So the man who's actually controlling the drill and the force he applies to each subsequent piece of steel is right here. Ralph. Guten Tag. Guten Tag. I'm Danny. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you. My English is bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My German is terrible. <laughs> OK. I started, and you? Perfect. So Ralph just turned the drill on. He's going really slowly right now to get a sense for how much the rock is pushing back. As he takes his readings, he slowly increases the power. Or let's rewind. A computer records how much force it takes for the drill to cut through the rock, giving geologists a sense of what's in front of the TBM. Well, as you can hear, I just increased the pressure, which means the rock is actually pushing back, which is good news, because the soft geology is likely through it and actually into some good, solid hard rock. Good rock. <laughs> I like it. About 100 feet in, the drill hit good, hard granite. But it also revealed that the first 100 feet were much softer than expected. If it's too dangerous to drill through, they'll have to stop the TBM and manually blast through the danger zone, adding five months and $10 million to the schedule. So tell me about what was discovered during the exploratory drilling. Yeah, through the drilling, uh, we find out some very, very soft material, and so now, we're very nervous of the situation. If this were soft rock, what could happen? Yeah, it can collapse and fall down, and that's a great problem. Uh, that's a big problem. Yeah. To find out if the TBM can safely move through this soft rock, geologists are doing a rare secondary exploration using an endoscopic camera to peer into the mountain. And you don't do this very often. No. But in the moment, we have a very special situation. So we use this camera thing. It's just the second time or third time ever. Ever. And so what do you hope to see by putting the camera in there? We hope to see just a small band of the soft thing. So that looks good. But we don't know. I mean, essentially, we're giving the tunnel a colonoscopy. Sorry? You know, this one. You know sometimes when they want to check out your insides, yeah. they put the camera. OK. That's just a rare. Same thing, huh? S same thing. Same thing, yeah. Yeah. The camera shows the physical structure of the rock, information the drilling can't provide. So this is it right here. So wow, that's amazing. So essentially, they have an endoscopic camera attached to the end of this blue thing. And they're essentially going to stick this camera in a pre-drilled hole about 150 feet out that will tell them exactly, by eye, what is happening in the rock. And I've always wanted to do this. That's not the tunnel. That's my mouth. Geologists look at the pattern and colors of the rock for clues about its structural integrity. If you look at that screen right now, what you're able to see is exactly what geological condition we're going to experience 150 feet in front of where we are right now. This is like that scene in Star Wars when the monster came out at the, uh... Oh, that's amazing. So when you look at this image, tell me about, so as a geologist, what you're taking away from that image. Yeah, what I see is a uh, stone from the side, and you can see the structure, and you can see that it's the same structure as the stone we have in the back of us. So when you look up, that, that same kind of black and gray, the same lines you're starting to see just around that edge. Like right there, that white, that white fissure right there. That is nice news. That's good news. That's good news, yeah. The footage shows that despite its softness, the rock is structurally sound, and the TBM can safely bore through it to get to the hard rock. So if this means this rock is good, that means that rock out there is also good. Yeah, absolutely. So as a geologist, does that make you smile? Yeah, it's mine. It's a good rock. It's a good rock. Coming up, preventing a major train derailment with a drainage system designed to stop thousands of gallons of water. This can't be the easiest way to do this. But first, who holds the record for the longest tunnel in the world? The answer, after the break. The answer to the trivia question, currently the Saikan Tunnel in Japan is the longest in the world at 33.3 miles. 
The Alps are some of the largest mountains in the world, a thousand feet taller than the Rockies. Although they span across seven countries, half of the Alps' highest peaks are in Switzerland. Ah, to be in Switzerland. Amongst the beautiful snow-capped mountains, breathing in this incredible fresh mountain air. This is about the last I'm gonna get of it because today I'm going into the mouth of the tunnel where it is dark, it is hot, and it's buried deep under the Alps. The Goddard Base Tunnel gets its name because it cuts through the base of the Alps more than a mile below the peaks. Now, while this depth creates a fast, flat route, it also puts the tunnel in danger, not only from the enormous pressure from above, but also from the large quantity of water inside the mountain. The Swiss Alps, if you think about it, are a waterlogged mountain range. There are lakes and streams up top, as well as snow-capped peaks. And when that snow melts, all that water will slowly percolate through the mountain and ultimately come down into the tunnel, rusting the steel and eroding the concrete. Over 1,000 gallons of water seep into the tunnel every second. If it's not contained, that water could be incredibly dangerous, eating away at the rock supports, potentially collapsing the tunnel, or rusting the high-speed rails, causing a major derailment. So the challenge is to find a way to take this 36-mile-long hole and make it waterproof. Gunter, the challenge is the Alps are full of water. Yes, lots of water. I know. You know this. I know this, You're yes. from here. You know this. I know this, yes. How do we keep the water from going into the tunnel and rotting out the steel and rusting out the railroad tracks? With uh, polyethylene, this is absolute security. This is what keeps it dry. No chance to come water out. No chance. This tunnel has one of the most advanced tunnel drainage systems ever made, hidden behind the tunnel's concrete structural wall. A thin sheet of yellow polyethylene actually creates the watertight seal. Under that, a thicker layer of plastic protects the waterproofing from the tunnel's rough walls. Finally, small spacers create a half-inch gap from the rock face, allowing water to flow down into a drainage pipe. And the key to the entire watertight system, installing it without any punctures or seams. And so to make sure that it's solid with no seams or holes or edges, we're going to unwrap this around the entire circumference. Yes. One piece. Uh, we found this. This is no problem. All the way around. All the way around. We found this. The layers are made from 100-foot-long sheets of seamless plastic. In total, they'll use more than 50,000 sheets to seal the entire tunnel, enough to reach from New York to Boston and back again. Now, one of the oddest things about building a tunnel is that you're working with an upside-down circle, right? And you have to cover every single inch of it. So rather than go up, build some scaffolding, get higher with more scaffolding, they've created this rig that moves 360 degrees around and lets us unfurl these sheets of drainage mat in one single shot. Cook! Coming down! Look out, cookout! Sorry. The drainage mat is secured to the wall of the tunnel with gray plastic caps. There it is. They do more than just attach the drainage mat to the tunnel. These caps are made from the same polyethylene as the yellow waterproofing. And when heated, the plastic bonds together, seamlessly attaching the waterproofing to the tunnel walls. So what Philip's doing right now is taking a heat torch, putting it on the back of the plastic, and melting just a little bit so there's no tape, there's no nails. He's literally melting the two pieces to form one solid bond. The heat gun, called a hot air welder, melts the plastic at 600 degrees. We're going up top now, huh? Yeah, give me the heat, give me the heat. So essentially, he just put 600 oh, degrees behind me, and now I'm pushing the rubber against it to melt the two, one to the next, and it is burning the crap out of my hand. And we're not, we don't stop, we keep moving. We're doing this in one shot. We're moving, we're moving. Ah. Oh no. Side, more. You gotta be kidding me! Why don't you guys wear gloves? This, is, this can't be the easiest way to do this. That, that's just the easiest way. Believe me. Quinter, what's going on? You're going nuts out here. We've taken one piece wrapped around the entire circumference of the tunnel to guarantee that absolutely no water gets in. But to do that 
it is absolutely madness. Just, just pure madness. Gunter's team can install up to 10 sheets a day. And with just two and a half miles done, it's going to take them two more years to waterproof the tunnel. So now that we've done this, essentially, this section of the tunnel, the longest tunnel in the world, has just become watertight. No, no chance. No chance. I work here, no chance. You did it. Oh, yes, I did. Gunter said no water's coming in. If you believe anyone on this site, and there are some very reputable people, I would believe Gunter. Gunter. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Although the water has been contained, the tunnel still faces enormous stress from the mountains overhead. With peaks up to 15,000 feet high, the tunnel is under trillions of tons of pressure and has to have an extremely strong reinforcement to keep from collapsing. The tunnel is now totally watertight. The next step is to give it its strength in the form of a solid concrete cylinder. The way they do that is using this apparatus right here, something called sliding formwork. Basically a 30-foot-long mold, this formwork shapes the concrete into the final structural wall, almost a foot thick for strength. All right, here it comes, check that. As he turns that wheel, it's opening up. This concrete is coming out, and we're gonna fill the entire circumference of this tunnel, 30 straight feet of it, and that begins right now with this concrete. Now the concrete is growing. The concrete team's biggest challenge is maintaining a uniform density around the whole circumference. If the wet concrete is allowed to naturally settle at the bottom of the mold, the tunnel won't distribute the stresses from the mountain evenly, cracking and caving in. To avoid this, the mold is poured nine feet at a time and allowed to set for 15 minutes before the next pour, making it strong enough to hold up under subsequent layers. But if the concrete pours down, you have no access, except for this. They developed a series of windows or almost portholes that open up and allow the guys to get inside and actually vibrate the concrete as it slowly rises around both sides of the cylinder. Can I get in there? Can I look? Yeah? OK, so where I am right now is actually what will become the concrete wall. This is the outer layer. This is the inner layer of the formwork. And as you can see, the concrete is getting poured in and will slowly rise, filling this one foot cavity all around. This 30 foot section will require over 20,000 gallons of concrete, making a wall strong enough to stand up to the enormous pressure from the mountain above. But keep in mind, that was 30 feet. We have 35 more miles to go to make the longest tunnel ever attempted. Coming up, starting up one of the biggest machines in the world for the final push through the mountain. So if you see this, yeah. you're happy. Yeah, super. That's super. Super. Super cool. Super. The Goddard Mountain Pass is one of Europe's most important trade routes. And since the 13th century, engineers have been struggling to find a faster way through. People always tried to improve, actually, uh, ways through the Alps. First, it was just horses with freight on their back. Then right. they built it a, a small street. Then, actually, the, the boom came with the railroad. Even 100 years ago, the desire would have been, if possible, to bore right through the Alps, have a straight shot. Exactly. It's just that in, in the 19th century, the people didn't have the technology to build such long tunnels. The technology finally caught up 12 years ago when Switzerland broke ground with their first tunnel boring machine. Now, they're just four months away from completing the first high-speed route through the Alps. But the TBM has got to stay on course with surgical precision to ensure a clean breakthrough. 17 miles inside the tunnel, the team is gearing up for the final two-mile push through the mountain. Get to ride in the front of the train with who I think to be possibly the happiest train driver I've ever met. You're Felice. Hey. You're driving the train. Felice is ready. 
He is happy and enthusiastic about the endeavor I am too. Not as happy as him, I don't think anybody is. But we're ready to go. Come on, let's do this. Let's do this, I love it. Great. All right, we're going in. After 16 hours of intensive geological exploration of a dangerous section of soft rock, the TBM team is finally ready to begin drilling. Are we here? Yeah. End of the line. In these last two miles, the TBM team is facing fault lines and intense pressures from the mountains overhead, making it especially challenging for the driver to both stay on course and avoid a collapse. Hello, sir. Hello. How are you? Fine. I'm Danny. Yannick. Yannick? Yeah. Yannick, are you driving the TBM? Yeah. All of this madness out yeah. here, all this driving, and all... Yeah. All of it. All of it. Right here. Yeah. We're advancing yeah. right now. Yeah. So finally, after some time, some very complicated geology, Yannick behind the ostensible wheel of the TBM is smiling because the TBM is mining. We're pushing against the open rock face, and rock is coming out of the cutter head and out of the tunnel. So if you see this, yeah. you're happy. Yes, super. That's super. Super. Super cool. Super. As Yannick drives, a team installs metal support beams to keep the tunnel from collapsing. Oh! They've got to stay in constant contact to keep the TBM at just the right speed. If the machine moves too quickly, the crew won't be able to put up enough rock supports, leaving the tunnel dangerously weak. This is how fast we're moving. This is for millimeter. So right now, as we speak, we are moving 53 millimeters per minute. Yeah. 53 millimeters, so that's five centimeters per minute. So that's like a very small amount of distance in a minute. This moves very slowly. Very slowly. As he controls the speed, moving less than two inches a minute, Yannick also plots the course to meet the drilling team on the other side of the tunnel. A deviation of just five hundredths of an inch, about the thickness of a CD, could cause a misalignment of more than two feet by the time they break through. To realign the tunnel, they'd have to shave off tons of material from the existing walls, changing its shape and compromising its integrity. So as we speak, we are angling a little bit to the left and a little bit up. During the nine-hour shift, Yannick checks and adjusts the TBM's heading more than 100 times based on real-time GPS readings. He controls the horizontal and vertical path with the TBM's two massive grippers. They also propel the TBM forward, advancing at six feet with each stroke. This, this moment is perfect. No have power. Good penetration. It's perfect. Yeah, perfect. We have good power, good penetration, good travel speed, beautiful looking rock. What more do you need? <laughs> Other than maybe not being 6,000 feet under the Alps. But barring that, we are finally in good shape. Yeah. When you need one, uh, buy a machine, I'm going to New York. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to New York? Yeah. Well, the good news is Yannick wants to come visit me. The bad news is his method of transport is using a TBM, which at 49 millimeters per minute means he'll come visit me in about 14 years. <laughs> After a half century of planning, Switzerland is just five years away from completing the longest tunnel in the world. And if all goes well, high-speed travel through the Alps will be possible for the very first time. Switzerland is famous for the Alps. It is what's defined the image of the nation for hundreds of years. But at the same time, these mountains have also transformed the country into a barrier, disconnecting it from the rest of Europe. So the historical challenge has always been to find a way to connect to other countries while contending with this enormous geological impediment. And it's been an 80-year dream to not just get over the Alps, but find a way through them. And after 20 years of design and construction, they have just about made this dream a reality. And if you come to Zurich in 2016, you can hop on a train and be in northern Italy in just 2.5 hours. And all the while, travel right through one of Mother Nature's biggest obstacles.